Istanbul Vinak, everyone. Good morning and thank you all for joining us from your various locations. Whether you tuned in from Fiji, the Pacific region, or around the world, your time is valuable and we thank you for choosing to spend it with us this morning. On behalf of International Ideas Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific, I would like to welcome you all to the fourth webinar of the Democratic Development in Melanesia webinar series for 2023. We would also like to welcome our panelists and of course you are participants. Now as part of International Ideas Asia and the Pacific Regional Programs work plan for 2023, these webinars aim to provide opportunities to citizens of the Melanesian region to take part in substantive discussions surrounding democracy in Melanesia. It is also intended that through the webinars, citizens of Melanesian countries who participate may gain knowledge on the subject matter and on the experiences of other countries. This will in turn enhance debates on institutional and procedural involvement in their respective democracies. Now the fourth webinar titled Democratic Development and Melanesia webinar series is a civil society budget monitoring. Now citizens tend to take interest in or engage in political processes if they feel that it will be beneficial to them and rightfully so. Budget monitoring is the process by which citizens observe and analyze public documents during the budget formula formulation and approval stages of the budget cycle. This monitoring is done in order to determine and raise awareness about how public funds are allocated. However, in the rush to spend money and deliver services, accountability is often compromised, increasing opportunities for corruption and mismanagement. Civil society groups and activists must be armed with and trained on the tools they need to, to demand that governments be transparent about where the money is going, how much is being spent, and who is benefiting. They must also be in a position to influence future allocation of funds. Now, this webinar will have two speakers who will deliver their presentation first. Um, by the way, these are the house rules. And then the audience can ask their questions after the speakers have presented. To do this, members of the audience can use the raise hand feature to ask questions. And the audience is reminded to keep their mic off during the webinar and to only turn it on when asking questions during the question and answer session. However, if you're in a position where you're not able to use your mic, or if your mic is not working, you can pose your questions through the chat feature. Now, before, before we proceed any further, just note that this session is being recorded. Also, and as with all webinars with International IDEA, I have a disclaimer that I am required to read out. The statements, views, or opinions expressed in this presentation do not necessarily represent the institutional position of International IDEA, its Board of Advisors, or its Council of Member States. Now, if you haven't already done so, I'd like to humbly request that everyone please put their mics on mute as I introduced our first speaker for today, and that's Ms. Lucia Langilebu. Ms. Langilebu graduated from the University of the South Pacific in 2014 with a Bachelor of Law and Bachelor of Arts majoring in journalism. She joined Pashatum Lawyers in 2015 before joining the Citizens Constitutional Forum in 2018 as a policy and research officer. One year later, she became their program manager, a role that she has flourished in till date. And it's no wonder she has a passion for international law, human rights, democracy, and developmental work. And as such, has received training on human rights standards, instruments, mechanisms, and frameworks that are available internationally and locally. She's contributed national submissions on legislative reforms, reflecting on good governance principles and democratic processes and values monitoring and evaluating the impact of human rights activities, public participation and policy development. While working for CCF, she's been involved in the program design of project activities focused on supporting democratic processes and civic engagement, in particular, uh, the conceptualization of activities within CCF's parliamentary support project, particularly in the capacity building of communities on parliamentary engagement, advocacy, and civil education. She's also been heavily involved in carrying out CCF's trainings and workshops on parliamentary processes, human rights, constitution, freedom of speech, UN Universal Periodic Review Framework, and this, ladies and gentlemen, is just to name a few. Ladies and gentlemen, our first speaker for today, Ms. Lucia Langilebu.
Bulobinaka, everyone. Hello to everyone joining uh, joining in this webinar. I hope you can all hear and see me clearly. Thank you. Um, special acknowledgement to uh, to uh, special thank you to Idea for um, for organizing this webinar. Um, it's a very important topic. Uh, for Fiji as well as other countries that participate um, in the monitoring of budget systems. I'd also like to take this moment on behalf of CCF to acknowledge uh, International Budget Partnership uh, that is represented by uh, Ms. Swad Hassan uh, with us today uh, on this panel. Um, before I begin with the presentation, I'd just like to provide a brief background of the Citizens Constitutional Forum. The Citizens Constitutional Forum is a non-governmental organization um, with about 20 years, over 20 years um, in experience in community education and advocacy on human rights, uh, good governance, democracy, multiculturalism, um, and rule of law. Uh, CCF works with communities uh, in educating um, low, in educating um, about the principles uh, of these thematic areas that I've just mentioned um, for their active participation and in lobbying policies to ensure um, democracy and rule of law and human rights are observed and protected. Um, since CCF's establishment in about 1991, um, CCF's vision is to make Fiji a nation where people live together in equality, justice, peace, respecting the rule of law that guarantees democracy. Uh, that's a, that's just um, a brief background about CCF. Uh, now I'd like to shed a bit of light on the work that CCF has been doing in partnership with International Budget uh, Partnership. The reason that I'd like to uh, explain a bit about this is because um, this partnership is has been critical in our monitoring of Fiji's budget uh, system. Uh, so CCF has been part of this research called the Open Budget Survey since about 2008. Um, when this survey actually started, CCF uh, began with the monitoring of hard copies of budget books, uh, which were released by the Ministry of Finance. Uh, and then through monitoring of government websites on the availability of budget documents. So we actually moved from monitoring hard copy documents uh, since 2008 to um, specifically documents made available um, online on official websites from the government. Now the Open Budget Survey, or in short OBS, um, is known to be the world's only independent uh, fact-based research instrument. And I'm sure Swad from IBP will shed more light on this. Um, uh, this particular survey is internationally accepted it, um, to, ex to assess public access um, to central government budget information, formal opportunities for public participation in national budget processes, uh, as well as looking into the role of uh, budget oversight institutions, um, such as our own um, Office of the Auditor General. The survey also helps local civil society uh, organizations assess uh, with their government on the reporting uh, and use of public funds. So the latest survey that was released for Fiji, um, which IBP worked with CCF on, um, was back in, was done uh, for the financial year of 2020-2020 until uh, 2020 uh, sorry, 2021. So the survey was released uh, for the year uh, 2021. Uh, I'll move straight into uh, the three key areas that OBS focuses on. So the three key, key areas that this survey focuses on is um, our transparency, budget oversight, and public participation. 
In terms of transparency, um, for this arm of the survey, it measures public access to information on how the, on how the central government uh, raises and spends public resources. Um, this is also an assessment done uh, on the online, uh, on the availability of online materials, uh, the timeliness in which these materials are provided, and how comprehensive uh, these materials are. So when I'm speaking about materials, uh, we are actually focusing on eight key budget documents. Um, and these are the pre-budget uh, statement, the executive uh, budget proposal, the enacted budget, citizens' budget, in-year reports, uh, media reports, year-end reports, and audit report. I'll explain uh, a bit further on what these documents entail as we go through this um, presentation. Uh, but continuing in continuing with this uh, first key element, transparency, um, we need to understand that uh, transparency for a country that scores about 61 or above in uh, transparency, this means that that country is publishing enough materials uh, to support an informed public debate on the budget. So from the survey, if you see that a country has scored more than 61, uh, that means that there are enough budgets uh, provided online on the website uh, to keep uh, members of the public informed about their budget processes or uh, the budget content for that particular country. For Fiji, for the 2021 uh, survey, Fiji scored a transparency score of 37 out of 100. Um, <clears throat> and it ranks about, and Fiji ranks about 79 out of 120 countries. So in, in saying that 37 out of 100, yes, Fiji has a lot more work to do uh, so that we can actually um, be identified as uh, giving enough materials, sufficient materials to the public to be informed about the, uh, the budget systems and the uh, actions taken by the government in terms of uh, uh, execution of budget processes. Uh, for for Fiji, the recommendations that um, the recommendations that came out of the survey in terms of transparency uh, was to improve on budget transparency in terms of uh, publishing the pre-budget statement and in-year reports online in a timely manner, uh, and to produce and publish the citizens' budget, media review, and year and report online in a timely manner. Uh, the comprehensiveness of the audit report and act enacted budget were also issues um, that were raised um, through, this, through this survey. So just a bit on um, the eight key budget statements. Uh, the pre-budget survey, which, uh, sorry, pre-budget statement, which I had mentioned, uh, this is a document that discloses the broad parameters of fiscal policies in advance of the executive executive's budget proposal. So it's a document that outlines the government's economic forecast, anticipated revenue, expenditures, and debt. Um, I think just to just to give a bit um a, a bit more clearer a, a clearer definition of these eight key budget documents i'll just share screen um of brief uh, brief definitions of these eight key budget documents uh, instead of me having to explain to uh, to each and every one of these documents i might bore some of you and i hope some of you don't fall off to sleep <laughs> uh, so i'll just share screen now uh, Please just bear with me as I share screen. Uh, okay, hang on. Share screen. There we go.
Uh, can you all see that? I hope it's clear. Okay, so these are actually the eight key budget documents and um, full disclosure, this beautiful document here, this really uh, helpful and insightful document was put together by International Budget Partnership. Um, and it's a, a very uh, user-friendly document, uh, which which CCF can share with the, with the participants uh, who are interested. Um, so you can see that, the pre-budget statement, which I was explaining, uh, the definitions of the eight key budget documents are there, pre-budget statement, the executive's budget proposal. Um, so the executive's uh, budget proposal is for, um, is basically the proposed budget, which is put by the state. So for, for Fiji, for instance, um, this is the proposed budget that the government um, releases in Parliament. So recently that was uh, just in, I believe in the last, within the within last month or so, uh, where the Minister of Finance um, announced the budget uh, proposal in Parliament before the debate took place. So that is actually the pre-budget statement. Uh, for our Fiji participants. Uh, sorry, that is actually the executive's budget proposal. Then we have the enacted budget. This is actually the budget that um, that has been um, enacted in parliament. So approved by legislature uh, and then and then enacted uh, by the various institutions. We also have the citizens' budget, which is a simpler version of the enacted budget. It is, uh, it is a less technical document, which is user friendly um, and allows a member of the public to have a better understanding or a fair understanding of what has been approved uh, in the budget or what has been included in the enacted budget. Um, then you have the in-year reports, the, um, as you can see there, the media uh, review, um, year-end report, and the audit uh, report. So um, I, I hope um, that you are all able to read these um, brief definitions of the eight key budget documents, which um, which the open budget survey focuses on in its assessment. I will just stop sharing. <clears throat> All right. So that was for the element of transparency in this uh, in the open budget survey. Uh, moving on to the second key element of the survey, we have the op the budget oversight. So for budget oversight, uh, this is where the survey assesses the role um, that the legislatures and the Supreme Audit Institutions or um, the Office of the Attorney Gen uh, Office of the um, uh, Office of the Auditor, um, uh, Auditor in Fiji, uh, plays in the budget process, uh, and how oversight is, um, how they provide oversight. Um, the survey also collects uh, additional information on independent fiscal institutions. Uh, and the legislature and supreme audit institution in Fiji together um, for this particular survey in 2021 provide weak oversight during the budget process with an oversight score of 28 or out of 100. So for, for us, Fiji's parliament provides weak oversight um, during the planning stage of um, the budget cycle and weak oversight during the implementation stage. Uh, 
And at this juncture, I, I would like to remind our participants that this survey was based on the 2020 to 2021 financial year, uh, not the recent um, recently announced budget. So for budget oversight, some of the findings um, that I've just mentioned is that Fiji scored 28 out of 100. Uh, one of the recommendations, a few recommendations that we have from this survey regarding budget oversight is to improve the legislature's, um, to improve is that the legislature, legislature sorry, uh, should debate budget policy before the executive budget proposal uh, is tabled and approve recommendations for the upcoming budget. Uh, the executive, we also recommend that the executive budget proposal should be submitted to legislatures at least two months uh, before the start of the budget year. And the legislative committees should examine uh, this executive budget proposal um, and publish reports with their analysis online. In, in that sense, we are emphasizing that before the government um, presents its executive budget proposal um, in parliament, uh, this should at least be done two months, given um, two months before the start of the budget year. Uh, so for us, the new budget year begins in, for us in Fiji, new budget year begins in August. Uh, so if we can at least have the budget proposal or announcement in parliament at least two months before that. Um, and to strengthen independence and improve audit oversight um, by the Fiji Office of the Auditor General uh, require we also require legislative or judicial approval to appoint and remove the head of the supreme audit institution. So this uh, this also adds to the independence of that institution. Um, so that's to do with budget oversight. Uh, moving on to public participation, the third uh, key element in um, in this survey. Uh, this survey assesses the formal opportunities that is offered to the public for their participation through the different stages of the budget process. Um, so we, through the public participation arm of this survey, uh, we look at the practices of the central government, um, the executive, the legislature, and the Supreme Audit Institution by using 18 equally weighted indicators um, aligned with the Global Initiative for Fiscal Transparency's principles of public participation in fiscal policies. Mouthful, but we can provide further uh, information on that uh, if, um, if you're interested. So for, for Fiji, we scored um, 17 uh, out of 100 in public participation. So basically in the arm of public participation for this survey, we're looking at how well uh, these institutions, the government, the uh, office of the Auditor General, how they're able to provide the public opportunities uh, to actually uh, assess the budget processes um, and also provide their, their view or their perceptions and their experiences. Uh, so for Fiji in that financial year, in the year 2020 to 2021, Fiji scored 17 out of 100, which is not really, uh, not really good for a small country. Mm. Let me just... Um, and you'll see for Fiji, some of the examples that uh, 
the government offered public participation was through the consultations that were done um, virtually and um, and done in person where possible. Uh, remembering uh, that the year 2020 to 2021 was during uh, COVID, during the pandemic uh, phases in um, around the around the world. So with uh, with that experience in mind, most of the consultations were also carried out virtually by the then Ministry of Economy. So some of the recommendations that came out of um, this survey regarding public participation uh, was for uh, the Ministry of Economy to pilot mechanisms in monitoring budget implementation um, as well as uh, sustaining direct engagement with vulnerable and underrepresented communities during pre-budget deliberations. Fiji's parliament established public hearings, has established public hearings related to the approval of the annual budget, but we recommend that it should also prioritize uh, certain actions such as allowing any member of the public or civil society organizations to testify during its hearings on the budget, on the budget proposal prior to its approval. So in this in this manner, when when members of the public or civil society organizations are given the opportunity uh, to be heard on the proposed budget, we are also able to give our insight um, on how this particular proposed budget may fare with our uh, daily experiences in communities and from our observations as civil society organization. Uh, another recommendation to uh, the Fiji parliament is to allow members of the public or civil society organizations to testify during its hearings on the audit report. So in that way, we are also able to give our testament uh, on how an enacted, enacted budget um, and its execution has actually fared um, within communities with uh, members of the public, whether it has worked out, what has worked well, um, suggestions that we may have for, um, uh, for with regards to the audit report. We also, um, Fiji's Office of the Auditor General has, has established mechanisms for the public to assist in the developing of its audit program. Uh, we recommend that it should prioritize uh, actions to improve public participation in the budget process by establishing formal mechanisms for the public to contribute to relevant audit investigations. Um, so um, I've covered all three key elements of um, the open budget survey. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. I know um, some of the terms may have uh, may have um, been too technical for our viewers, but I'm happy to discuss. And uh, I believe Swad will have more to add on and maybe simplify the terms. <laughs> Even better than I uh, than I have uh, stated through my presentation. Um, yeah, so I look forward to a Q and A session. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa. Sorry, Lucia. My apologies. Um, that was an amazing presentation, but also for the work that you've done and continue to do. Now, for those of you who would like access to the survey, um, Ms. Hassan was kind enough to post a link to the summary in the chat window. I'd li also like to take this opportunity to re-remind everyone that if you have questions, you may post these questions in the chat feature, which will be addressed later in the webinar. And now last, but certainly not least, a final speaker for today, Ms. Suad Hassan from Open Budget Survey. Ms. Hassan joined the 
International Budget Partnership in May of 2016 and is based in Washington, DC. As a program associate with the Open Budget Initiative, SWAT is responsible for data collection and review of the Open Budget Survey and coordinating and providing technical assistance to civil society partners and governments throughout the survey process. She also assists with other research projects related to budgets and budget transparency. Prior to joining IBF, Ms. Hassan worked as a journalist with a news organization in New Delhi, assist assisting with coverage of political stories. She holds a bachelor's degree in economics and a master's in international relations from American University's School of International Service. Ms. Hassan, thank you so much for joining us today from the United States. Over to you. Thank you, Amelia. Uh, thanks for the warm welcome. And thank you, Lucia, for the very comprehensive presentation. I'm so impressed. Um, I would also like to thank International IDEA for giving IBP an opportunity to present our work here. Uh, what I'm going to do today is I will share my screen and share what um, IBP, International Budget Partnership, does, which will give you an idea of uh, some of the ways in which civil society can monitor budgets, um, in addition to what Lucia already highlighted through the Open Budget Survey. So just give me a second here. Here we are. So uh, the International Budget Partnership is an INGO. Um, we work with partners globally all around the world. We work with budget uh, analysts, community organizers, as well as advocates who can advocate for a budgeting system that works for the people and not just for special interests, just a democratic style budgeting system. Um, and uh, I want to note here that IBP, uh, being an international NGO, works somewhere in the middle tier, where we don't work uh, at the community level directly, but we work with partners, such as CCF in Fiji. Um, and uh, through this work, we are able to uh, build the capacity of our partners um, and further allow them to do their work adapted to what they feel is relevant in their countries, as opposed to us coming in with some prescriptive notion of what is uh, supposed to be done in their countries, what we consider good to be, uh, to be good for their countries. Some of the ways that IBP works is by strengthening civil society organizations around the world. We conduct numerous capacity building trainings on how to analyze the budget and how to conduct effective advocacy through building communication plans, et cetera. Also how to find opportunities um, to advocate, be it legislature, be it um, the Supreme Audit Institution. CCF has been a part of these uh, trainings in the past um, uh, as well. We not only work with civil society organizations, we also collaborate with them and other accountability actors. We have programs related to tax and budget credibility where partners go into their budget uh, budgets and analyze, really look into the data um, as well as go on the ground to check the realities on the ground they have meetings and advocacy meetings as well as um, meetings about data collection with the local government officers to then match whether what was written in the budget versus what actually happened in the ground is there or not. A huge part of IBP, again, being an international organization is to produce research materials, um, including what Lucia talked about the open budget survey is in a large, we a research product where we assess the uh, budget transparency globally, and I can come to that later. Um, and lastly, we engage international and country stakeholders uh, to promote improved budget systems, practices, policies, and outcomes. So a huge part, again, in addition to capacity building is peer exchange. Uh, IBP holds a lot of global meetings, global platforms. We are we take special pride in saying that um, in our meetings, we offer a platform for civil society and governments from the same country to join 
together and work together in understanding how to improve the budget systems in their countries. Um, so it's a very collaborative approach. Um, but also we hold several meetings uh, where countries can come together to exchange best practices. Uh, this could be regional, this could be global. We, in the recent uh, years, have held quite a lot of uh, virtual meetings post-COVID on the audit institution. And I'm very proud to say that um, the UNDP's representative from um, East Asia, uh, sorry, uh, the Pacific Asia countries joined us and really was able to talk about the auditing system in Fiji. Um, and so, yeah, we've offered a platform to interested Supreme Audit institutions also to share best practices on how they have engaged civil society organizations and just citizens in general in their audit work. Um, about the open budget survey, I think Lucia has provided a lot of information. I can give you some high level information. This is a global assessment. It's, as Lucia said, the only comparative and independent assessment of fiscal transparency, oversight in the budget process, and public participation. Now, what one of the goals of this uh, survey is to assess transparency. And we all know that once you're able to quantify a problem, you're able to solve a problem. So through these regular uh, once in two years kind of assessments, you're really able to see the progress that a country is making over the years. And we also, if interested, always assist our civil society partners as well as the governments to understand how they can improve uh, budget transparency. The idea is that through this global platform, when you recognize the, the gaps, you can improve transparency based on uh, global norms and international standards. That's what the Open Budget Survey is based on. Uh, it's based on standards set by IMF uh, and OECD. And once there is transparency in the country, it's the citizens who can take it on to hold their governments accountable. That's the idea with the Open Budget Survey. Um, we've noticed um, through our work over so many years that uh, comparison really ends up working well. Um, countries often uh, are not trying to necessarily hide information, but often just don't know what information citizens would expect. The survey has been written from the point of view of citizens, so the information that citizens find important so we look for expenditures and revenue sources and um, uh, whether there is gender budgeting and whether there is disclosure on where the donor funds are coming from, how much debt does the country hold. Uh, all of this is information that then civil society organizations take over to understand what the health spending is in their country, also gives them an opportunity to compare it with other countries. Um, it depends on whichever issue is important in the country. For example, I'll give you an example of uh, Kyrgyz Republic, which is a Central Asian country, former Soviet um, country. Uh, and um, it's not a very high income country, but for some reason, healthcare in the country was really, really poor. Through budget transparency, through analyzing their budgets as well as budgets of neighboring countries, they realized that the per capita um, income within their country, the per capita expenditure on health was much lower than the standards that are uh, advised by World Health Organization, um, as well as uh, much lower than their neighboring countries and the outcomes were evident in the population. So a coalition was formed that um, advocated for better health policies, but this coalition was based on, or was you know, a, a collective of groups that work on good governance as well as health practitioners themselves. So it was a really good way to connect the grassroots with the national level policies um, in Kyrgyz. And they used uh, the parliamentary budget hearings to come together to use a common voice um, and uh, uh, advocate for stronger policies. And I'm happy to 
share here that they were successful in getting funding for some of the core uh, diseases that were not covered with the, by the healthcare system like cancer and HIV AIDS medicines. Um, and now the coalition is also helping monitor the implementation of that budget uh, that was uh, increased for them. Uh, moving on, so the OBS is, you know, the accountability system is a combination of transparency, oversight for that transparency, um, which is offered not just through parliament and through the uh, Supreme Audit Institution, but also through media and through civil society, and then public participation to complement this transparency. Together, we believe this forms a really good budget accountability ecosystem. Um, in, as Lucia mentioned, the last round covered 2020, 2021, we are currently researching um, along with our prolific partner CCF for Fiji uh, for the 2023 round. And the results would be released um, sometime in May of next year. Within the Melanesia region, we have Fiji, Indonesia, and PNG. If time permits later on, I can show you the country summary for Indonesia. Within this region, Indonesia is really a star performer. They have put in a lot of effort to improve transparency um, and they have very good quality uh, information in their budget documents. Where they fall short is on public participation, but from what I understand from Indonesia, they're trying to increase internet penetration because they have so many islands that it's really hard for them to um, have a cohesive uh, mechanism for participation. Um, and then, yeah, in the past, we have collaborated with country and regional organizations um, as well. So starting a few years back, uh, our team, the Open Budget Survey, more in detail, uh, more specifically, went into capacity development for civil society organizations. So what we did was um, instead of providing general trainings on the open budget survey, we actually uh, uh, created uh, courses that were more relevant to their uh, countries and offered it to some of the organizations that work on health or education or infrastructure. Uh, however, everything that they look at is from the point of view of human rights. And we were just hearing that there is a gap in trying to understand policy through the budgets because we know that budgets are very much the main policy document of a country where if a government has promised, um, you know, um, primary education to all students, but only dedicated a very minimal part of the budget to it, then there is, uh, there is a lag in what was said versus what what is being um, what is going to be fulfilled, uh, this holds true especially for policies related to the environment, where there is a lot of talk about putting in funding for climate change. Uh, however, the money almost always ends up being diverted elsewhere, and then um, you know we don't see the results. So. In the tailored capacity development, we offered strategic uh, accompaniment, we offered mentorship, we offered one-on-one -on -one, um, uh, uh, sort of hand-holding, if you may, call, we called it PFM Buddies, um, issue-based peer learning. So we just connected groups uh, with each other from around the world, happy to do that to uh, any of the organizations um, attending today's uh, event as well, um, and exchanges with the IBP country offices. Advocacy is another huge part. We do recognize that sometimes in addition to the local partners, a lot of the um, acknowledgement comes from an international organization that is peer reviewed as well as recognized by a lot of international donors um, as well. So we recognize that. So the open budget survey is used by the European Union, um, uh, their aid arm, as well as the World Bank and open government partnership in assessing 
who they would be giving uh, aid to. Um, so some of the criteria includes democratic indicators as well as fiscal transparency. Um, so we, as uh, to the extent possible and if invited, do attend and advocate alongside our partners. We never try to overtake them ever, but we uh, advocate alongside. The country strategies, uh, we develop country strategies focusing on particular issues that are of relevance to the country, again, in partnership with the partners on the ground. Uh, and IBP and our partners engage in a broad range of advocacy activities. This depends on wherever there is an opening. Um, in some countries, legislatures are generally more open than perhaps Supreme Audit institutions, or in some countries, the executive is very motivated. So we see where there are openings and we work with our partners there. Um, another stream of work that may be of interest in terms of what civil society can do, and this is related to sustainable development goals, is, the, uh, is budget credibility. What is budget credibility? Is it, it is that if um, say $100 was promised for uh, climate change, say through just planting more trees, uh, but at the end of the year, only 50 was spent, why did that happen? So, and in some cases there's also overspending. Um, so just an example of budget credibility from around the region. So for example, in Sri Lanka, um, the agricultural sector employs 26% of the country's labor force, but suffers from declining productivity. I mean, 26% of the country's labor force is huge. Uh, it's, it's a quarter. Regardless, the government budget for agriculture and irrigation was underspent from 10 to 40% annually um, throughout the years, except during the election year, which I'm sure it doesn't surprise anyone because during that year, they had to proof results. So the uh, budget credibility project is very much a research project. Again, here too, we work with our partners. Sometimes once there is a credibility issue that is identified just by analyzing the budget, you go on to the ground, um, interview people, see what is happening on the ground to understand what really is the credibility problem. And um, the idea is of course to improve service delivery, which is uh, by far the most important aspect for most citizens. Uh, another example from the region, and this is um, this is where IBP, I would say in some ways is, is growing. Uh, we also see this as an interest from donors, unfortunately, is country level presence. So we are now in close to six countries most of them happen to be in Africa and with the exception of Indonesia. So we have an IBP country office in Indonesia. This office uh, works again with partners um, to on issues that are of relevant, relevance to them. Uh, one of it is I think they create community scorecards to understand the uh, family uh, plans that are meant for families below a certain income and how do families or the recipients rate the services that were uh, uh, meant for them. So it's kind of a social audit, you can think of it, where the, the on the ground, we are checking against the reality of whether what was promised was delivered or not. In addition, one of the things that IBP Indonesia's office worked on is tracking government's fuel subsidy. So what they noticed was that the fishing community was really uh, miserable, but they had a lot of budget that was allocated for them. Um, however, what was promised to the fishery sector was never delivered to them. So with IBP and CSOs, when they went into the budget documents and really analyzed through the execution reports, which is the, as Lucia mentioned, the in-year reports, the mid-year review, the year-end report, when they looked at these reports, they found out again that what was promised was never delivered. And sometimes these changes happen without the approval of parliament. They just happen at the back end. So you go back sort of certain years to see um, the implementation of, of, of the budget. 
And so by calling the government out on this and working together as a coalition, again, the, the uh, fisheries community was able to get um, what was promised to them. Um, and as you can see by these figures here, um, they realized that 74% of it gets diverted to other, uh, other sectors, often sectors that have stronger lobbies. Um, yeah. And I will stop here, happy to take any questions. Um, and uh, if you are interested in reading um, about these research products or our work, uh, internationalbudget.org is our website. Thank you so much. Amelia, over to you. Thank you very much, Hassan, for that uh, incredible presentation. Uh, we'll now take um, uh, questions. If anyone has a question, please feel free to use the um, uh, raise hand feature that's allocated that's at the bottom of your screen. However, like I said before, if you don't have um, access to a mic or if your mic is not working, please feel free to uh, put your question in the chat feature. But um, there was a question I thought I, that I'd ask to kind of get everything started. I know how sometimes it takes people a while to get their thoughts uh, in order and pose their questions. Um, this is regarding Ms. Lani Lewu's presentation that was done earlier, but I guess it's a question that um, I could pose to the both of you, uh, seeing that you both have um, incredible experience. And I think um, Ms. Lani Lewu, you said earlier that Fiji scored 37 out of 100 in our transparent, transparency ranking, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in, in both your opinions. Um, you know, what could Fiji have done better? And how does this kind of lack of transparency affect the everyday citizen? Ms. Langelewu, if you'd like to go first and then I can, I can get Ms. Hassan to answer after. Uh, thank you, Amelia. Uh, in terms of transparency, uh, for us from, from the survey, one of the key recommendations we uh we made was for the timely timely production and availability of some of the eight key budget uh, documents just a few of them actually the the pre-budget statement the in-year reports um as well as a publication of a citizen's budget uh, media review and year-end reports so the availability of these documents online actually gives the public, members of the public, um, access to, to information as to how um, the state is using public funds or how uh, the enacted budget is being implemented or actioned by the various uh, institutions or ministerial agencies. So in that sense, when these documents are made available online, we as members of the public are able to assess for ourselves how uh, the public funds are being utilized, um, whether the actions that the government had said that they would take through the enacted budget is actually being implemented uh, and what more work needs to be done. So, in, so all in all, you know, um, Everything is out there, all the information is out there, the public is able to access it. I do understand uh, that these are mostly materials that are available online. Um, so if this can be channeled to other accessible means as well by, by our government, then all the better for members of the public. So for our, um, for, for CCF, those are key recommendations uh, we are making to improve on transparency. I hope um, I hope that provides some um, some that that's an answer to your question, uh, Amelia. Thank you, Ms. Lagilevo. Ms. Hassan, if you'd like to share your thoughts. Yeah, thank you. Um, I can't speak to the. Sorry about that. Um, I can't speak to the context, um, uh, political context in, in Fiji, but just as um, a, a person who reviews the open budget survey, I see that Fiji does not make a 
execution information available to its citizens. So there is information on what is planned for next year, but there is no information on how the budget is being spent. Generally, we've seen in the open budget survey that you know, there is more planning information. So, you know, governments generally like to make big promises and um, highlight those big promises. But when it comes to the execution, that's where they lack. And the open budget survey, as Lucia had mentioned, measures the execution in four, um, four documents, which is uh, uh, the monthly report, the mid-year review, the uh, annual report, uh, the year end report, the financial accounts that are supposed to give you sort of a, a good reflection on what happened in the year, why were some of the programs not implemented as they were promised, what happened to the aid that was coming, the revenues that were promised, all of that, including a narrative explanation. Um, and I think that's really missing in Fiji, but one of the interesting things I found about Fiji uh, compared to the rest of the countries is that they have a really active uh, pre-budget consultation system. And it almost feels like, well, if you have pre-budget consultations, how are citizens would be more empowered to follow up if they had access to some of this information that is kind of withheld. Uh, for a long time. Um, yeah, so I would I would leave it there. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Hassan. Okay, so um, I have uh, two comments that were shared in the chat window. The first one was from Mr. Ulai and uh, Tui Koro, and he just asked if you could please uh, make mention of the country that you were referring to when you were uh, making reference if you could please make reference to the country that you're referring to when you were making your comparison with fisheries. And uh, the second question, Ms. Hassan, was, um, and this was asked by the chat window as well from an anonymous attendee, what is IBF's plan on holding the same kind of surveys in South Pacific countries like Vanuatu, Samoa, et cetera, that are not in the recent surveys? Yeah, both very good questions. Um, I'm going to link to uh, the the fisheries example is from Indonesia, uh, and I'm going to link to it. Uh, just give me one second. So here, it's a really good example. It follows. It's very easy to read if you want to read it because it follows. Uh, it almost as a story. Uh, first, it follows one uh, lady who uh, whose life was in a way transformed through this program and is now able to make use of the, uh, the fuel subsidies, which earlier she was not even able to sometimes go out into the water for fishing. Um, regarding uh, including other countries, yeah, unfortunately, that um, is something that a request that we get often, but uh, it's something that uh, we try to, how should I say it, um, be representative of the region. Um, so, you know, there are, it's not possible to include all the countries of the world. Um, so we try to include a few countries from every region around the world. Uh, but your, I take your request well, um, and I can I can bring it to the team and see if we uh, can do something. What the way around it would be is that we have conducted pilots sometimes in some countries that have shown interest, um, which gives you an idea of how transparent the country is compared to other countries. Over to you, Amelia. Thank you very much, Mr. San. Now I have a question for uh, Ms. Langilevu. Um, and um, th that is, I, I noticed that uh, in a document that you shared earlier that the citizens budget was not produced um, when you did share that budget, sorry, when you did share that document during your presentation. Uh, why do you think that is? And what are some of the obstacles that you feel um, are present that will prevent the government from publishing a document like this? And I guess, Ms. Hassan, you could, you could probably lend your experience to that as well. Uh, what are some instances that you've seen where, in cases where the budget, sorry, where the government hasn't published um, 
a citizen's budget? What are some of the obstacles that they faced in maybe uh, countries similar to ours that might have, that might draw parallels to Fiji? Uh, thank you, Amelia. Um, yes, the, the citizen's budget has never reduced since the last uh, survey uh, for Fiji. Uh, you might have all seen in the um, the uh, information that I had shared earlier that Fiji had not uh, produced the citizens' budget. Um, I cannot speak on behalf of the previous government uh, that did not publish a citizens' budget, uh, but from responses that we um, have indirectly received or uh, monitored and assessed as to why this has not been published uh, would have been to do with a lack of resources. Um, again, as Ms. Hassan has uh, rightly said, the more uh, investment and attention being placed on the executive's budget proposal, that phase of the budget process, there being more focus and attention uh, put into that as compared to um, documents being made, document or information being made available and accessible to members of the public, such as the citizens' uh, budget. Um, I can't really say for sure why the government, uh, why the previous government failed to produce this. It would have been a really helpful guideline, a guide to the members of the public as to uh, what the enacted budget entailed, um, what they would look forward to in terms of public services, uh, where improvements were being made, why money was being placed, why more public funding was being placed in a particular uh, ministry or particular service, um, that would have been great. Uh, and, um, and, and that is something we are actually looking forward to uh, this year, um, if in case um, some of you may not know, Fiji has finally produced a citizen's budget uh, this year. <clears throat> uh, and this was released, I believe, last month by the or earlier, sorry, earlier um, this month by the Ministry of Finance. So even though that has been produced, we are also going to monitor how well the public receives uh, or responds to this particular guideline. It is a first step for Fiji. Uh, finally, we have a citizen's budget, um, but there are many other ways that uh, the Ministry of Finance can improve this in terms of accessibility. But you know, um, it is great that uh, that we finally come to producing a citizen's budget. But in, we also we also need to understand the political context uh, that Fiji was in uh, in the previous in the past sixteen years um, to maybe understand better as to why the citizen's budget was not produced. But again, that is a question that would be better answered by those who were in leadership in the past 16 years. Thank you. Thank you, Lucia. To add to what Lucia was saying, and uh, again, this is not specific to Fiji, but often what we have found- um... Sorry, over to you, Amelia, or Ms. Oh, Ms. Hassan, if oh, you'd no, like I'll to- just, uh... Uh, Very briefly, just uh, compliment what you're saying. What we have found is that um, uh, countries lack resources, not just financial, but often human resources as well. So it's about just assigning a team to, often it is the communications team, uh, to create a template for citizens budget that could be then repeated year after year. Once you have a template, it becomes easier to follow the same and plug in different numbers, um, but that starting point can be hard. So I'm hopeful that um, Fiji would continue producing the citizens budget. It is really such a popular document in many countries. 
um, especially uh, because budgets can be so technical, this is sort of a window to understanding what the government is promising. Yeah. Over thank to you. Thank you so much. Sorry, Amelia, if I could just add on. I'm sorry, I, sure. I just wanted something quickly. Um, so for Fiji, the, the good thing is that now it is mandatory for for the Ministry of Finance to actually publish a citizen's budget. Uh, the reason why I say that it's mandatory because it is now in law uh, within the financial management of 2021. So it's actually something um, good, I would say, that came out of the last, uh, the last uh, government that put this into place, um, that quote, a user-friendly summary of the annual budget within one month after the date the annual budget is approved by parliament. So with that particular provision in law now, um, within a month uh, that the budget is approved by parliament, Fiji would need to expect, Fiji would expect a citizen's budget to be made accessible to members of the public. Uh, so that that is something great, um, and it's something that the Ministry of Finance now uh, will need to uphold and continue to improve as we move on. And it's also an area that civil society organizations can help out with, especially uh, in getting our communities, our members, uh, the members of the public, to have access uh, to this in important information. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Lange Lebu. Um, sorry, to the person who, to the anonymous attendee who had asked about, um, uh, who had asked about the example uh, that Ms. Hassan had used earlier, she's actually posted a link in the chat group. If you'd like to take a look at that a little later on, um, so if you'd like to read more about it. Um, I, I have to admit that um, I really loved the answers to your questions. And I did have a follow-up question but in the interest of time, I'll ask the two questions that were asked in the chat feature by Mr. Ulaipui Koro. And uh, his question was for you, Ms. Hassan, and that was, do you partner for advocacy workshops? And if so, how can we reach out? Yes, thank you so much for that question. And I, I really genuinely wish the answer was yes. Um, unfortunately, the, um, the workshops and um, uh, are open to our partners that IBP has engaged with for, for some time. Um, so I recommend you reach out to the partners that are that we work with on the ground. Um, and perhaps we can share materials with them related to how we've conducted the advocacy workshop. It's yeah, I wish we could uh, open ourselves to everybody, but unfortunately it's a big world. Sorry about that. I understand. Thank you very much, Mr. Sana. Ms. Lucky Lebu, his second question was for you. Um, does CCF engage in budget, budget advocacy or capacity building workshops on budget guidelines? Um, yes, we do. Uh, in, um, in the past, we have, we have implemented budget advocacy workshops. We have um, also uh, made dissemination plans uh, in terms of the open budget survey and recommendations from there uh, to be made available with our CSOs uh, as well as members of the public, even to the extent of uh, communities. We have worked with FCOS as well in uh, extending the um, in capacity building in terms of budget advocacy and processes. So um, yes, we do carry out budget advo advocacy work. Um, and you know, we also, uh, as I have said, we bring this down to the grassroots level. Uh, and part of these budget advocacy workshops is helping members of the public draw up their uh, budget submissions, uh, whether it be their own submissions or um, through CCF. Um, and if it is through CCF, we echo their submissions um, to the Ministry of um, 
finance and in the past Ministry of Economy, um, whether it be in public consultations or the consultation specifically for civil society. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Ms. Langilevo. Um, if we do not have any more questions from our attendees, I'm going to give uh, the both of you a few seconds to gather your thoughts so you can deliver your closing remarks. Uh, but thank you so much uh, to both of you for your wonderful insights today. Now, while they uh, gather their thoughts for the closing remarks, I'd like to extend our appreciation to all of you for being here this morning to participate in today's webinar. The greatest tools we have in our possession are always education and information. Together, hand in hand, they can allow us to make smart, informed choices, but also allow us to hold our leaders accountable for the decisions that they make, or in some cases don't make. Now with those few words, uh, Ms. Hassan, would you like to give your closing remarks now? Thank you, Amelia, and thank you, International Idea, for this opportunity, as you said, Education and information is our weapon. Um, I recommend and encourage each and every one of us to not be scared by how technical budgets are. They really have the power to uh, transform accountability uh, in each country. So um, yeah, more power to budgets and more power to civil society. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much for your time today. And thank you so much for the work that you do. Um, Ms. Lange Levo, would you like to give your closing remarks now? Um, thank you, Amelia. A special thank you again to International Idea for this uh, wonderful opportunity to um, further advocate, advocate on the findings and recommendations of Open Budget Survey. Special thank you as well to um, International Budget Partnership, especially to you, SWAD, for always bearing with us and helping us through this uh, these surveys um, and we look forward to completing the current survey that we're working on together and we look forward to releasing that to the people of Fiji and advocating for more change to come about um, in the country. Um, as for civil society organizations, while this survey is being carried out by IBP with uh, CCF. This survey is really the work of all the civil society organizations. The recommendations are for all of us for the benefit of the people of Fiji. Um, and we've seen, in, uh, even though changes may not come about overnight, in, these changes may slowly come about. And we've seen that with uh, the recent production of the citizens uh, budget. Uh, and for, for us CSOs, that is a testament to, um, to persistent and um, strategic uh, advocacies, as well as solidarity amongst us CSOs to work together uh, to see that change does really come about, not only through policy, but uh, through actions by the government. Uh, so I would like to encourage all of us um, on this uh, on, uh, on this webinar to continue to work together. Um, and if there's a need from any organization to for CCF to maybe give a skill share or information session on, on the OBS and um, the findings from Fiji for the last uh, surveys, please, please feel free to reach out to us. We can also provide further information sheets such as the one that uh, Ms. Hassan has shared um, that can be shared to your communities, to your target groups as well. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Langilevo, for your time today and for all of the work that you and CCF do. Um, we'd like to thank the both of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here with us this morning. Now, I know I already thanked our panelists, but I wanted to, again, on behalf of International Idea Fiji and International Idea Asia and our Pacific Regional Office, we want to thank our speakers and especially you, our audience, for joining this live event. Ms. Hassan and Ms. Langilevu, thank you for your time, but more importantly, for the work that you both do. It is important, it matters, and we see you. Thank you. For our attendees, if you enjoyed this webinar, then we'd like to strongly encourage you to look out for the dates of our next webinar, and we look forward to your participation. Until then, from the International Idea team and I, Bilaka Bakalevu and Nisa Modemana.